the American Theatre Wing, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts bring you the American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre. This session, The Composer. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin with the American Theatre Wing, and with me is composer Cy Coleman. Cy Coleman, a man, winner of three Tonys, three Emmys, and before too long, three any other awards that there are on the face <laughs> of this earth, we hope. <laughs> Cy, I wanted to, 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 to start by asking, did you know you always wanted to be a theater composer? Uh, no. <laughs> Where did you start? Is, uh, the answer is no. I started off, um, I had a beginning career as, um, as a pianist. I started as a concert pianist, actually. At a rather young age, I believe? Very, very young, as a matter of fact. Uh, it was the... Um, the milkman <coughs> who sent over his son's piano teacher. Now, don't ask me what the milkman okay. was doing <laughs> there, but I have no idea. But anyway, but he, he heard sent you over playing his, the piano. Yes, and her name was Constance Tallarico, and she decided after a little test that I had perfect pitch. And I think, you know, I'd picked up the piano by myself. So I, you know, it's a nice, it's a cute story, which I'll just throw in here. Uh, my parents owned a couple of houses in the Bronx and tenements and somebody skipped the rent and left the piano, and that's how we got a piano. I, that's a pretty good... <laughs> you, you know, when you try to skip the rent, it's hard to get out a big, lumbering, upright <laughs> piano, so evidently they left it, and okay. it, was, it became my source of enjoyment, and I became obsessed with it. I think obsession is a very good thing <laughs> yes. in our business. Well, you know well, what I mean? It yes, gives you uh, a very good beginning. Yeah. Well, get and so I was well on my way to the theater, not even knowing it, you know, having this obsessed approach to the piano where I played night and day, and my father finally, who was a carpenter, had to nail the piano shut, <laughs> and, uh, which didn't stop me. Oh, I good. played on the wood. That's great. <laughs> but what were you playing? Uh, well, I was, you know, uh, when I first got started, I was playing things that I heard on the radio. Right. And there were pop songs that I would pick up, and evidently in that, what attracted um, um, this teacher to come over and I studied classical, and you know, I was going to be a concert pianist. And my life was going to be a concert pianist, and I developed a good, hearty technique and a facility for it with a love of Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Somehow Beethoven had the, the meaningful <laughs> depth to which I wanted to go and satisfied me. It was none of the frilly things. I was not interested in the frilly things. Right. And then you turned 13. Only later. <laughs> if I was say, <laughs> then you turned 12 and decided frilly things were good. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, are you reading, you're reading my entire biography. It's, of course, you know, that uh, when I got into my teenage, I decided, did I really want to be a concert pianist? And by the way, this was a very hard decision because, you know, there was a lot of scholarships involved. Right including one at a very dramatic school called the New York College of Music, where they were very strict, and I was getting a scholarship, and they expected me to be a concert pianist. And so it was very difficult to go over there and say, no, I don't think that that's where I want to go. But you, you became, and, and I, cer I certainly know, have been known f for a, a, being an extraordinary jazz pianist. So I assume that somewhere, somewhere on the way to being a theater composer, you wanted to have more immediate access to creating music on your own, right? Well, see, you know, that was funny, because what they did ask me, uh, why? Now, you know, most teenagers know how to say no, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to explain and I was no exception. There was something within me that said, no, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And it was not just having a little tantrum over here, and, oh, I'm tired, right. I don't want to do that, I don't want to practice this anymore. Right. It was just a simple no, and I couldn't answer it. Later on, you could say no. it became apparent to me. No, well, I did say no, but you know, it became apparent to me why I was saying no. Uh, and, it's, and you hit it right on the head. Evidently, there was a, it's a recreative art, you know, and, it's a right. not, and I, I don't want to, you know, um, no, belittle the importance of that because, you know, when you work in the theater, you realize what the importance of that is to your creative art. Absolutely. Uh, but what it is is that uh, just something within me wanted to do, and I wasn't sure what that was. There was something that wanted to have my own voice, that wanted to speak. And did it start as a jazz pianist? No, it didn't start as a jazz pianist. It started, I went to Music and Art High School, and um, and I was uh, you know with all the you know Music and Art High School, which was a wonderful one. It was up at 135th mm -hmm. Street and Covent Avenue, and it was a wonderful school. I mean, being around a lot of musicians right. and artists over there, it was a, an amazing atmosphere. I can, can't you know talk more about those kinds of schools that are dedicated to the things that. Uh, 
uh, that people like and have in common. So, so being in a place like that, being obviously, and like being that, exposed to yeah, all different kinds of things. Being exposed to all kinds of things. And um, I was, because of my technique, I was one of the main pianists, you know. So now, when you went to music and art, you had to take another instrument, too. But, uh, but I'm going to stick with the piano for a second. So people would bring in sheet music and have you play for them? And is, is that how, how did you learn about no, no, it? was all, you know, first of all, I lived here, you know. He's, uh, uh, now, also, what it is is that, you know, I didn't have um, the pockets full of money that my parents were handing me. They weren't. As a matter of fact, very little. So I had to work it out. And we had a farm up in Monticello. So as a result, they wanted me to move to Monticello. And you said, and I said, no, 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 no. Sorry about that. It's too late for that. So, so, I, I, so I made some money. As, a, as an accompanist? As, both as an accompanist. And uh, there was a show called, which I remember this, called If the Shoe Fits. Mm -hmm. And I was playing at the Century Theater, which was on 59th Street, I believe. And Dave Raxon, the composer of Laura, the film composer, uh, was the composer of that. And I went after school. And I made extra money playing for the show. Uh, now, uh, that was a bit of exposure right. there. But, you know, I could read fast and I had the technique and so forth. So that was, but I was aware of, you know, the, uh, some of the theater things going on. I wasn't thinking but of it much for myself. Yeah, when, when did you think that, you know, I mean, obviously for the moment we're talking about musical theater. Mm -hmm. When did you see musicals and think, I want to create those? Well, you know, um, I must say it was a little budding idea, but uh, I thought of myself as a musician more mm -hmm. than a theater composer. So where I was coming from was really a musical base. As a matter of fact, you know, there was a certain snobbism that I carried over from classical music into what I was doing later, which is, oh, actors, you know, I mean, <laughs> musicians are real. And so that's, um, uh, you know, what I didn't really have that for a while, but I, the, the, the intrigue started then. But s singers and actors, are, are, did, did you grow up feeling that singers were musicians and actors weren't? Well, somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> somewhat. I had some of that, some of those notions. But you, uh, you also came through pop music. Didn't you compose pop music? Well, that's exactly what happened, because what happened is that right from um, that particular era is when I was accompanying a woman called Adrian. Adrian's husband was a producer called Michael Meyerberg. Michael Meyerberg was producing on Broadway. And um, he, um, Adrian, uh, you know, I, by the way, let me go a little back. I was studying with Adele Marcus also right. at the time, piano. I continued. I wouldn't let go. So I can, I, I, there was something that was just holding me. I was <laughs> guilty about letting up my classical background. So I was studying with Adele. And I wrote her, she was doing um, a concert, and I wrote her a sonata that she was going to do at Carnegie Hall that she unfortunately didn't do. She got sick, and she couldn't do the concert. And I played it. It was very strangely Russian in character. Mm -hmm. It sounded, sounded more like um, a Prokofiev piece than it did like an American composer. Um, and she sent me to a publisher called uh, Jack Robbins. Who's it was Robbins and, Robbins and right. Company. Now you are a, a I was still in school. I yeah. was still in school. But you are your own music publisher, which I want to get to later. I want to fast forward a little bit. I want, yeah. to, get, I want to get to Wildcat, which was your first Broadway show. Right, okay. So, so here we are. Now you've gone through all, all of that. And now, well, now but you, you asked about the pop music, yeah. and that's why I wanted okay. to say all right. that. Um, well, needless to say, he liked me. You know, he would dub me the new Gershwin, which right. everybody at that age who played the piano well was a new Gershwin. And he also commissioned me to write three etudes, you know, prejudice, rather. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the fourth, fifth, and sixth prejudice. <laughs> Leaving off one now I also started writing pop songs, uh, and with uh, with Joe McCarthy, Joe McCarthy, who we put me to together with. By the way, Joe McCarthy's father was a famous theatrical uh, composer or lyricist. Uh, did Rio Rita and My Sweet Little Alice mm -hmm. Began, all that. So I was getting some kind of exposure right. to writing and about lyrics. And in those days, we didn't have cassette players, you know. So I mean, I had to sit in the room with Joe hours and hours and play. play the melody over and over and I didn't know if I was going to last. <laughs> um, but this really kind of like it's got me on the road to thinking about theater. And the first things we did, uh, well I must say the first thing Michael Meyerberg, Michael Meyerberg of, right. of five minutes ago, right, right. Uh, 
hired me to do some background music for a show called Compulsion. So this is a score. Uh, it was a score. Okay. I had a little, you know, you know, I had some music, but I was getting acquainted with the dramatic, with you know, what to do dramatically and that sort of thing. So the producer hired you to write that. Yes. But, but who gave but you the the the, the, the sem sense of what kind of music they wanted to be there? The the writer, or the director. Uh, well, you know something. You know, I was frankly left pretty much to my own resources. Okay. Uh, I don't remember getting much help. So it wasn't, there was no, you know, you know, it's, you know, just do it, you know what right. I mean, and find yourself. You're a musician, you know how to do this. I see. So, of course. Musician of all trades. So yeah, you. well, exactly. So then uh, we, also, we also auditioned for a show called uh, John Murray Anderson's Almanac. Now, that was an interesting show because there were a lot of composers and lyricists that were adding to this review. So you were a young, you and McCarthy were a young team in New York. Mm -hmm. So and basically, you were going around to all the places that were interested in young songwriting teams to put. Right now, I must tell you this: is that we wrote a lot of songs. Joe was a very good lyricist. He was slow as can be, and he was difficult. I must say that he was a little difficult to write with. You know, we had a little drinking problem. And he was older than I, so he had a tendency to kind of like be my mentor. Right. Um, so, but we did sign up for John Murray Anderson's Almanac. And we had about five songs. We ended up with one. And the reason we ended up with one is because Joe couldn't finish. I see, but you had a foot in the door. We had a foot in the door, and we ended up with a song called Tin Pan Alley, which ended the first act. Not a bad position for a first song. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we had a song called The Riviera. Uh, and I must say that Joe had been very friendly with a woman called uh, Mabel Mercer. Mm -hmm. Mabel Mercer was the duena of cabaret and nightclub singing, and never, she became somewhat of a goddess. Now, a lot of the songs that I wrote with Joe McCarthy went to Mabel. And, then, and they were kind of like art songs and... But that helped get your w name around right the New York community, I would think. Right. And then we had um, my first pop hit was... Really, wasn't a hit. It was on the back of a hit. It was called Why Try to Change Me Now, which became mm -hmm. a, a cabaret favorite. And then I'm going to laugh you out of my life. So did, it's interesting. I know that producers are always wanting to go to the pop world to find composers for the theater. Is that kind of how you got in? Did, did, did no. producers... No, you kept... No, no. <laughs> Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, we go through certain eras. I think when, when musical comedy was starting, you know, when it was at its roots in the 20s, they were looking for pop songs that came out of shows. Then, with the, with the advent of Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, from, from what I knew, it was getting, integrating your score, getting, no, getting more, having an integrated score, and the, the, not only the trick, but the art was to be able to write a song that fit into the score and yet could be lifted out of the score. Right. And that is the art that I don't see so much today, but uh, would like to. Now, what we've... Now, how do you, how do, how do, you, yeah, how do, you we, do that? Well, well, well you know, but, then, but then again, you, you know, it's, it's a different world right now. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the difference is. Uh, the theater used to be a place where you can find, where people waited for songs. People held back scores because they wanted to have the people hungry for it. You mean a, a composer so a writing composer in, in composing. So as a, as a result of that, the publishers would hold back release uh, of the score. Now, what happened later on, well, Rodgers and Hammerstein and the people, you know, Frank Lesser and people like that, all our greats, you know, that, that had that, were in the era of writing those songs right. that could fit into the story and at the same token, come out of the story. Um, I mean, I've, some, I've, it's examples, you know, like, you know, for example, you know, Some Enchanted Evening. Um, you know, uh, Guys and Dolls, a lot of things from Guys and Dolls. I've never been in love before. I mean, it fit in, but there was generic enough at the same token to tell the story, and probably um, you led up to it with a verse that, that, that put you in the right place. Right. So, and you can fit in those songs. Not today, of course, we're going back to the 1920s, but we're not doing 
a place where you discover songs. It's we're going back to a place where you're hearing the songs that would become hits in another place. Right. I mean, that's such a tricky thing to it's, to, to integrate. It's a it. very, it's very, very tricky. But but when you wrote Big Spander and you started those great chords, bump bump ba dum bump did you think this is right for the show, or this is right for the show, and I think it'll have a life afterwards? No. As a matter of fact, what you picked was the exact phrase that gave me the entrance into Sweet Charity. Uh huh. I was looking, of course, you know, uh, when Fosse came to me and wanted me to do Sweet Charity, and I looked at the Knights Gaviria, and um, I saw what it was, and we changed it into a dance hall rather than at that time. Uh, you couldn't, you know, doing hookers wasn't. I just did. I did that later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did the sequel to it to later. <laughs> but what it is that I was looking for it and looking for it, and I had just started working with a new lyricist, which was Dorothy Fields, and uh, she wasn't new to the business. No, I but mean, she was she also was, older, right? She was so she older, was, yes. So she wasn't a mentor, but was was that an interesting? Uh, well, it was. What, yes, it was a very interesting uh, relationship. You know, relationship. I'll tell you why, because I I believe in those uh, those kind of relationships. Because she gave me something, and I brought to her something. I brought where I was in terms of where music was in, in the contemporary world, and she brought a certain expertise in knowing. But Dorothy had the kind of mind that wanted to find out what was going on. She would call friends, and she would get the, what, what are people saying today? What are the young people saying today? And she would pick up the phrases. And she would she would integrate them into her lyric, amazingly well. Amazingly well. But I mean, she was a true pro. You know, Dorothy wrote faster than anything. Remember, I now I, I had played nightclubs and everything. I came out in nightclubs. Dorothy got up at six o'clock in the morning, and, and worked in. in and she and she would uh, she would they would set up a card table, and she'd be finished with the lyric. They used to call they used to they used to have a nickname for Speedy. But they were all good. She had thought about it. She had gotten there. And then she'd want to call me, of course, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And, and you'd I was, be out there all night. Of course. Now, but you're talking about Big Spender. Yeah. Big Spender, I found my way when I thought about that vamp. I wanted, I wanted, yes, the vamp itself. When I found, I wanted something that said tacky mm -hmm. and that had some humor to it. And when I discovered, dum, dum, da, dum. Dun, dun. Mm. You knew how to get into it. I knew where to go from there. Now I, I, I want to have a song Big Spender too. Yeah, well, it's 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 a wonderful. Well, there's well there's but there's a little personal story with that too. I'd worked with Bob Fosse before. Now Bob Fosse, as soon as you wrote a song that he liked, it Bob used to break it up in ways that I didn't like necessarily. So you had to fight. So for I it. had to fight for the rhythms where he would break it up, where he would go for his rhythms. And Bob's answer always was, you know, I said you can't do that. And he said why? Why can't I do that? You can do anything. I said, well, no, it's not musically. So I decided when I wrote Big Spender that I would put in the accents in a place where he couldn't do a thing about them. <laughs> and I literally wrote it that way. So he couldn't, he couldn't get in get into that. He couldn't get into that. that I mean, you have wonder, these are wonderful stories about collaboration in the theater, because theater is the most collaborative of art forms. L let me sort of take this as a, as, as a background and say now, now because we're, we're doing these for, for people who are interested in, in composing, and I, I'd like to, mm -hmm. to talk a little bit sure. about what kinds of, of training programs you think would be good. What, what is somebody who wants to be a composer, what should they do? Okay, let me tell you, this is very personal, you know, because okay. everybody has their own particular way. I think it's very important to have an important foundation. My foundation was music. When you go to the theater, you're going to a place where you've got to know a lot more than what your foundation is. You've got to start learning. <clears throat> and then you, you feel mean about what all the other jobs are. In what the all the other jobs are. It's very important that you know where you're going, your environment, and what you're doing, and also to learn about the people who have to perform your material. But it's much easier to do that if you learn your, your, your particular trade first. And that means all kinds of music, uh, well, ha harmony and, and... Well, I think so. I think that the better, you know, and, and I'll tell you this, that what makes, you know, everybody says, you know, that you can, uh, for me, they say, well, you can do it, you're, you're quick. Yeah. I am quick. But what helps me to be quick is that I have a facility on the piano, too. What goes from here goes quickly to here and I don't have to struggle. But sometimes if you're going from here into somebody's here, 
Do you have pro are there problems with that? Uh, well, what it is is that I can demonstrate it. Uh, so you can you can demonstrate it. So what it is is that you you must first of all know who you when uh, going back to the performer now you must know who you're writing for. Okay, that's very important. Uh, for example, when my first show was Wildcat. Right. Now, obviously, I had a woman who had a range of five notes. Right. <laughs> Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball. Uh, now you don't write for her like you do for a great opera singer. This is not Joan Sutherland, or Tibaldi, or somebody like right. that. You don't have that range. Now, but the idea is that you want to really give her something to sing. And here was a big problem I had with Wildcat. Here was possibly the biggest comedy star in the world going on the theater for the first time. Right. And Carolyn Lee and I were committed to giving her something that was going to land for her. An opening number. An opening, opening number. number. Opening numbers are very difficult because opening numbers are just, I, I think they just, they just said the, the way, you know, for people, they don't listen. They hear, but they don't listen. If it's an up-tempo, it's ta da ta da it's, it's very hard to get across. People don't know who your characters mm -hmm. are. They don't have any emotional investment in them. So you've got to tell them something right off the bat. So you, something has got to happen. Now, what it is, I've got Lucy. Right. Now, Lucy is Lucy. Right. And we're talking... And, it's, and we're not talking about... We're talking about musical, but at the same time, we're not talking musical. We're talking about a personality voice. What do you do? And what do you give her that gives her that personality that, that, that allows her to be who she is and at the same time lands musically. But you also, if I can interject, you have a, you have a show that's based on a story or a, a play? Oh, yes. I mean, so you know where you are. You're in the, now, you're in not only that. She's playing the show. The name of the show is Wildcat. Right. This is set in Texas and around, right. around that area. Here is a woman who is with her sister looking for some kind of job Looking for a, looking to make her fortune, right? And a woman at so that you, particular time. So you have Lucille Ball in Texas and, and Texas all. and so forth. So now you can't. Uh, obviously, there's a certain. I'm not going to go into sophisticated harmonies, right? I can when I want to sneak them in for my own enjoyment, but what it is is that, and I do. Right. And, but you've got to find you've got to be but discreet. You, I mean, you, first of all, you've got to set, before you stray from what your, 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 the feeling of your music is, you've got to establish it. Now, how do we establish it with uh, a Lucille Ball? With all the other factors with going on. With all the other factors going on. And it was very difficult because what it is is that, you know, we were fine, we were writing other things. But you wrote a song and you threw it out, right? Didn't you write a song for Lucille Ball and discard it and then we come back to it? We wrote ten songs. We wrote ten songs for her. But what is it that, no, the Hey Look Me Over came, which we're going to. Right. Uh, no, everything I wrote sounded like Ethel Merman. But she wasn't Ethel Merman. Right. And I didn't want her to sound like Ethel Merman. And even though maybe I wrote something that she could sing like Ethel Merman, I didn't want people to think that's what we were doing. So, and it sounded, you know, and I just... It was in a rut. We wrote the rest of the score much easier. It was much easier. That opening um, number was the problem. Finally, after about four or five weeks, we have a great deal of the score. I remember it was as simple as this. You know, Carol Lee said to me, Cy, what if it wasn't Lucille Ball? And we weren't concerned about Lucille Ball. What if it was just somebody who we had to write for that sang like that? I said, well, if I had that yoke off of my neck, I said, I would sit down and play this. I would, I, would, I would just write this. And I played the tune of Hey, Look Me, hey Over. Look Me Over. And we laughed because, you know, we, you know, we had now had some pop hits. It was the best is yet to come right. and so forth. And did music, did music or lyrics come first or did you, with you and Carolyn Lee? They came in every which way. Okay. Every which way. No, they, would, no, they just weren't, um, they came, they, you know, which way. And, you yeah. know, it was a, I'll quote Richard Rodgers. What comes first is the check. Right, right. The know, it's, it's never the musical. So you, wrote, you played that melody. But I played that melody. I, no, but, you know, it goes back and forth. Even though I played the melody, it doesn't end up that way. I had the opening phrase. Right? Da, 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 mm. da, da. Now, this is... And we laughed. She said, no. She said, but we can't do that. This is our, this is our debut. Right. Even though I had done some reviews and she had, this was, our, this was it. She said, you know, people are going to know us for that. It's too simple. You know, this is, you know we're more sophisticated than that. So you were your own worst editors. Oh, no question. 
And, but what happened is that I left her. I was working over at her house, and I, that, that evening she called me. Said, you remember that funny little melody? Da, 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 da. I said, yes. I said, you know, I wrote a funny little lyric to the part, first part of it. But hey, look me over, lend me an ear. Fresh out of clover, mortgaged up to here. I thought that funny. So, so, but so did, did you go, Eureka, that's it? No, I didn't say Eureka. We said, that's funny. We both laughed and said, yeah, but I thought it's a cute song. But we're not going to write it. We're not going to put it in the show. Now, so we discarded it. And we had a publisher called um, Buddy Morris, but it was run by a fellow called Sidney Kornheiser. And we got to Sydney. We went over to his office on 54th Street. We were playing him a lot of the score. And we said, you know, we got this funny little song. It was Sidney Kornheiser who said Eureka. Ah, see, somebody did. Somebody, somebody said did. Eureka. He said, that's it. <laughs> and we're looking at each other. But see, I, th I mean, I think the, the, the lesson in that, in that story is you never quite can tell, and you have to keep, keep looking and keep searching as a composer. Mm -hmm. And we finished it. And to tell you the truth is that when we first met Lucille Ball, who was more nervous than I, than both me and Carolyn, and here we are, this big star, and we, you know, we didn't, why, why should she be nervous? She's a huge star. She's Lucille Ball. She's Lucille Ball, but she was nervous. That was another lesson. Big stars, when they have to come and do things in musicals and everything else, are as nervous as anybody right. else. Anyway, we played the entire score, and when she when we got to Hey, Look Me Over, she stood up and she said, I can sing that. Oh, that's great. And she did get up, and we worked. That's great. And that was uh, another big lesson, too. And, of course, it was, um, it became an, you know, an immediate, it was a strange kind of hit that came out of the show, what we discussed before. Right, right, that it was able uh, to. There was a record on it. And the record that, uh, that they got over D.H. Morris, the only record they could get on a march, right. was a Danish group singing it with an accent. But, but it, it was played, the big radio station at the time was WNEW. It worked, and do you know, on the opening night, when she came back for her bows, the audience sang along with her. That's great. Now, you, you, are, you, you talk very much like a businessman. Um, and I know that y you became your own producer, or you became one of the producers of, of mm -hmm. your shows. Yeah. Um, it, it, did you do that because of your fascination by the business, or did, was there a necessity? Well, let me tell you exactly. There was kind of a necessity, and there was a... What happened is that Carolyn Lee had been with V.H. Mars for a long time. Music publishing company. Yeah. And... Um, he, you know, because he knew her, and Carolyn was very much, you know, Carolyn used to take a lot of advances. I never did, and mm -hmm. I felt. Also, we, Carolyn and I had this kind of like a very combative relationship. We were kind of like the, uh, the aftermath of Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, that, that relationship had to carry on, and we were in the finest tradition of that. But the, what happened is that he had given her a firm, he and I to. felt slighted. That you wanted your own firm. <clears throat> and I said, well, at least, I mean, these, these show these songs and these records are coming out of both of us. And he kept putting me off, and I kept saying, buddy, I said, you know, it's a, don't put me off too long. Right. I because, want to do this myself. Because, oh, you know, I want the same thing. Yeah. Now, but what he was going to, he gave her was a, a firm within his firm. And that's all I asked for. And that's music publishing, right? That was music publishing. And I asked for the same thing. That was a forerunner before everybody started publishing their own things. Right. And uh, he didn't. And it got to a point where it was too late. So you and, did it for, you did and, it for I, and I And I got my nephew and I put out a shingle. Hey, listen. <laughs> and that was it. And our first published uh, song was, uh, our first published show was a Sweet Charity. Right. And I must tell you this, is that because of my relationship, uh, with all the pop songs I used to record for Capitol mm -hmm. Records and because of what I had done at nightclubs and everything else, I had a lot of friends. Which helped a lot. Which helped enormously because you talked about Big Spender. I had a song in Sweet Charity called You Want a Bet, which became something right. else. It got cut. And um, that's an interesting story, too, about the evolution of that song and how it became Sweet Charity. I know, but, the, let me, let me no, no, but I'm, I'm going to yeah. stick with it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stick with it. And what happened is that I called Peggy to try to record You Want a Bet. And somehow, I wasn't getting through. I kept saying, it's a great song for you, Peggy. She says, mm -hmm. what else you got? So now, 
I said, well, we're working on this song called Big Spender, but it's not really a pop song at all. It's because I was thinking of it as a group song. And I was thinking of it more dramatically at that time because what did that song Big Spender say? And it was the crux of the show. Mm -hmm. Boredom. Right. It said, these girls who had to say the same thing over and over every night. So I was not thinking now as a pop songwriter. I was thinking as a, as, a, as a dramatic writer. And it didn't occur to me. I was not thinking that this could be a hit because I was thinking, this is the crux of the show. Uh, the lineup came from Bob Fosse and, and mm -hmm. the, the, the magnificent staging that he did. But the idea for it came from Dorothy and me, which was boredom. Night after night, same impassive faces, singing all of these things and these come-ons. And that was the humor of it and the tragedy of it. And that's what gave you that kind of like double-edged sword. And so I sang it um, the minute you walked in mm -hmm. the joint. I sang it on the phone. She said, she said, put it on a record. She said, I can make a hit out of that. And she did. That's amazing. Now, it, it, <clears throat> you said that, that that came up from out of a conversation between you and your, your lyricist. Did Neil Simon, the book writer, contribute to that? No. That was me and Dorothy. Have, did you come up with the idea? As a matter of fact, yeah. I'm going to tell you this. Neil Simon was not on the book yet. Oh, so. Neil Simon came in. Came, I came in on the book because Bob Fosse, under the name of Bert Lewis, was writing the book. <laughs> and it was the score. As we were doing the score, when we had, if my friends could see me now, which he told, and we had Big Spender, and there's got to be something better than this, Bob said, I wanted to write the book to this, but we need somebody else. This is, this is getting to be beyond. very beyond me. And so Bob Fosse flew to Italy, where he sat on Neil Simon's doorstep, who was doing a picture called The Fox. Yeah. And he brought the tapes of these songs. Vincent. And Neil Simon said it was these songs. So, that convinced him that he had to do the show. So the, these were sort of demo songs that you and Dorothy Fields... No, no, we wrote it to the book. You wrote, we wrote to the existing book, book. The existing okay. book that, that Bob Fosse had written under the disguise, under the pseudonym of uh, Bert Lewis. So, now, yeah. have, have you come up with the ideas of any of your musicals? Oh, yes, I did. I come up with lots. I'm, I'm, I love to do that. You're an idea man. Have you, ever, have you ever been brought on on something which you thought was a terrible idea to begin with? There was somebody else's idea? Well, let me think about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, let me see now. I mean, I know that your, your, your scores, when, yes. when you stack I, up Barnum and I Love My Wife and Seesaw and Sweet Charity, there, there's a wonderful eclecticism to the, to, you know, because mm. and on the 20th century, there's sort of operetta there, there's sort of ragtime in, in Barnum, there's all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that the eclecticism of that is part of being a composer, yes? Well, let me put it this way. If you really want to be a very successful composer, find your style and hammer it home. Okay, and what would, what, how would you that characterize that? Well, to me, style. what was more important than that was excitement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the excitement was not doing the same thing. Once I got something that I established, I wanted to do something right. else. Yeah. And I just was not attracted to do the same thing again. I might do it later. Or I might do something like that. But come back to it. Uh, but for example, the shows you mentioned. Um, and I'll go back to your other yeah. question, too, which was the show that the idea that, that I wasn't sure of. <laughs> but it turned out I did it because of my idea on it. <laughs> ah, was uh, that 20th century? Or? No, that was, well, the 20th century was the two examples are Barnum and mm -hmm. 20th century. Barnum was brought to me by Mark Bramble five years before I did it. But he had a book that was going sequentially, Barnum's Life. And I didn't find Barnum's Life terribly interesting. I found the circus interesting. But I didn't, nothing happened in Barnum's Life. I mean, it was a successful life, and it was a nice businessman, and I didn't find it particularly exciting. And so I passed. And then I wrote with uh, Michael Stewart. And we did a show called I Love My Wife which I love doing. It was a very inventive show. Um, it also has a, it, it's a sort of quintessential <coughs> Cy Coleman feel to the music. It was kind of a current show in a way for you, right? Well, it was a very, very, first of all, it was a very exciting style. It, it was originally a French play. But let me ask you something. You, did you do your own orchestrations and arrangements for I Love My Wife? Yes. Do you do that in all your shows? No. 
No. What makes you choose what you will and won't orchestrate yourself? Well, you know, we put it together, and you know, in a different kind of way. Joe Layton was the director, you know, and um, and of course, you know, poor Joe in the middle of uh, rehearsal had, had an accident, an accident right? and then Gene Sachs came in. But we could work together. We know how to do that. I know how to put it on. Uh, I was putting it with a small group, so I was putting my orchestration together as we went. Because it, so it was also the smallest small show you'd done. It was a small show, yeah. It was a small show, and it was generically right. And I, and I realized very early in shows is that your work as a composer does not stop. I mean, I'm there. I've, I'll do the vocals, and I'll do the dance arrangements, which the dance arrangements will take all your time because they say, why will you as a composer want to sit there and pound the piano? And I say, because I want the whole show to feel like my fabric. Now, are those different jobs that have different unions? The yeah. vocal arrangement, the dance well, arrangement? Well, you know, something, but I, yeah, but it's, it's, um, I, I just work it out. Right. I, don't, I don't go with you know, I don't say, so hey, somebody else thing, figures I, it out. I figure it out. You've got a lawyer, you figure that out. <laughs> right. I'm doing this. Or sometimes if I feel that the job is too much, because if there is a job, you've got to watch your show. I mean, it's like watching a store. You don't write it and put it in the, other hand, in the hands of other people. I don't believe in that. Your job is not finished until it opens, and sometimes it's not finished until after that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm involved in everything. I want to be there with, with the actors. I want to be there with the dancers. I want to make sure what the choreographer is doing. I want to make sure where the music is going, because I didn't work that hard to lose it right. in these last days. And what it is, the, the eclecticism, yeah, the, well, I, we'll go back to that. Yeah in a second, but I do stick with it. And I don't do my own orchestrations because orchestrations are really, you go home and you write out those scores and you, and you don't come in. And they're not done until the last minute. But clearly you as a composer, just hear, listening to you talk, you have, you have a great, you have strong and wonderful opinions about your, your stuff. So you're not mm -hmm. going to say to him, just orchestrate this. You're going to give an orchestra. No, 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 we're going to talk. <laughs> I know we're going to talk. And I'm going to lay out. I'm going to lay out what the arrangement is. I mean, nobody else is going to lay out the arrangement. I know where we're going to do this and where we're going to do that. But that also comes from your sophistication as a musician to be able to do that. Aren't some composers... Uh, I mean, is that a requisite, do you think, for a composer? Or do you think no, I don't think so. I think that's, that's my particular thing. I think you, you, don't, you don't have to. There are many ways to, to, to skin this cat. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's, uh, and there are many ways to do it. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, I, and I think they're all legitimate. I think if you have your style and you want to impose it, you know, and, and, and do that so that you're heard in your style, that's one thing. Let me put it, let me compare it yeah. to Hollywood. There is Cary Grant so you and there's Lawrence films. Olivier. Right. Cary Grant, every time Cary Grant, you know who he is. And he's, it's commercial. It's commercial. You know who Betty Davis is or who these stars are that have their, those identities, you know, and that's what Hollywood did. But the Laurence Olivier, who was the greatest, one of the great actors, did not do that. So he did not become as famous as the trade names. Right. And that's not saying that there was, I'm not making a, a quality of, you know, opinion of this. There is none. But do you think you're a Carrie Grant or a... No, a, over here. Over there, over here. Olivier. I want to write for the show, and I want to do something new, yeah. and I want to do something that, 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 um, my, you know, that, that gives me the hair in my back of my neck. It's up, and I want to do it every time. And slightly differently every time. And then, well, but slightly different is what excites yeah. me. That's great. You know, that, so that's, that's why it, it comes out that way. For example, you know, um, I was doing a few shows at the time uh, when, when Michael Stewart approached me for I Love My Wife. But with the, what, what excited me about I Love My Wife, it was a little friend show. It was funny. It was a very, very funny show. And the premise was, a strange little premise, was about wife swapping. <laughs> and you would think, okay, why would you want to do a show about wife swapping? But it was as innocent as a Disney movie. <laughs> it just happened to have that thing, and it was just a nice turn on it. Now, when they did it in France, evidently what the style was, they'd stop the, they stopped the action, and one of the actors would go over to the side and push a button, and a record would come on, and they'd pant them on the record, and then they'd go back into the story. Oh, I thought, yeah, I, and, I, and so what we did was we integrated four musicians with the four characters. And you have the bar in Trenton, New Jersey, and all of a sudden this guy who's coming and bragging about coming back from New York and all the sophisticated things, and he's a, a blue-collar guy from Trenton, New Jersey, 
And as they're talking about it, what happens is the, the bartender, or the guy from the head, the, the, you know, the down of the counter, right. picks up a bass, and they do a duet. And it was just wonderfully, wonderfully exciting. And, you know, the, and, and basically that was making music theatrical in a way. It was theatrical, and it was unexpected, and it was integrating the music in a way that has, was, has, has been much copied right. since then. And, that's, and that, we innovated. It was fun to do. It was yeah. fun to. Okay, now let's get back to Barnum. When we finished I Love My Wife, and it was a very satisfying, very tough experience. Mm -hmm. Tough because of? Nobody, well, what happened is uh, <clears throat> our producers first didn't have original producer, that our producer was going to close us right after the, the matinee because there was no faith in it. And is this a producer <clears throat> who, had, who, who you had approached or had approached you about the project? Okay, a little lesson in business yeah. for, for, for fellow composers. We had a com we had um, like a producer, very nice guy. He used to own restaurants and everything else, right. and produced before. Friday before Monday, first rehearsal, called Michael and I into his office, and said, uh, "I've got bad news for you." We said, "What is that?" He said, "We can't go into rehearsal." And we said, "Why?" And they said, "We've." He said, "Well, he said I don't have the money." I said, but if you don't have the money, we did 20 auditions for this, and, you, and uh, everything seemed to be going very well. Why don't you have the money? He said, to tell you the truth, I have a little problem, and I couldn't collect that money. I said, well, you let us do 20 auditions, it didn't collect. and you didn't collect the money, but you let us keep going. Why would you let us do that? He said, well, he said, my, my strategy was this. If I could get one, I could work it out. I get one big fish. Well, as you can imagine, Michael and I were absolutely just in the m deepest depression about our show. What are we going to do? So we went over, we went to the, his, re his restaurant and had a cup of coffee and decided we would audition it and look for other producers. Over the weekend? Yes. And no, but we didn't know. The, there was, no, rehearsals were canceled. They were canceled. Right? They were canceled. And so over the next few days, we played for three producers, and we, we ended up with one. And uh, they all wanted it. And um, we ended up with one, and it was her first time. But uh, she had a partnership, um, and um, he didn't necessarily have faith. He had a different kind of show business in mind. In other words, what it is is when you're trying to do new things. You were, this was an innovative show, and therefore it was, it was a tough one for a producer. And he, the producer, was tough for a producer because he wanted to push it into a more conventional thing. For example, he would tell me, Cy, you know, you know how to do big opening numbers. Why aren't you giving us a big opening number? And I'd say to him, the reason that I'm not doing that is because we have a very thin story. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to blow it all so that when we follow with the rest, it's all going to be a disappointment. So the so every show has a different character, every show has a different formation. Nothing, nobody says there is no strict formula. Strict formula. Uh, it bothers me, and I'm going to interject yeah. this, that I hear today about formulas for musicals. You got to have a charm song. The Y song. You got to have this, this song. You got to have this song. And everybody's writing it. It's like movies. Somebody has a class, and you do movies this way, and you have a bunch of cookie cutters. They come down. No. What it is is every piece of drama has its own needs, and you've got to get into that. And now, this piece of drama. But w w just in order to, f for somebody interested in, in writing, mm -hmm. would you recommend studying all kinds of different musicals so they can see how they're all done? Why not? And then, and then is it instinct that, that told you? I mean, I, it, go, I, went to, I went to musicals I didn't like, and I stayed. Right. One thing about it, people walk out of musicals, I never walk out. Because the second act may solve the problems. May solve the problems, and I want to see what they did. Yeah. You know, so forth. And how did you, you know, why is uh, there's something that's, that fascinates me with either the good or the mediocre or the bad? And listen, there are musicals that I didn't like that are quite popular. Yeah. But so, I mean, so it had nothing to do with that. It has to do with the matter of taste. Right. But what it is with uh, I Love My Wife, we started off with just a small little song, and it built. And then we went from there to a diner. And the whole story built and unfolded and unraveled. 
So you never, it had to go this way. Yeah. If you went here, you went there. Right. So that was the problem with, uh, with Allah my wife. However, I must say, you know, with, uh, uh, now the strange thing, um, opening, opening day, we said, uh, wow, my God, what are we going to do now? We heard the, we heard the rumor. Mm -hmm. We're going to get closed right after this. And this is a show about wife swapping. Innocent as can be mm -hmm. and funny as can be, but our first audience are the blue-haired ladies the matinee. of Theater Guild. And I'm saying to Michael, Michael, we are dead. We are finished. I mean, this guy evidently wants to close us. I think she likes it, I don't, but I don't know. And I don't know what's going to happen. And we happened, the matinee started from the minute the curtain went up. They were rolling with laughter, hooting and so hollering. So go predict who is going to like what. Oh, absolutely. And to put it, frankly, they saved us. That's great. I want to ask you, um, what kind of advice would you give somebody who is, who is starting out a career and, and wants to be Cy Coleman? Or wants to be, Stephen Sondheim for that matter, wants to be a writer of the musical theater? Well, I can give you uh, the, the work for Stephen or me or anybody. Number one, make sure that you love it. Make sure that you really, I mean, examine yourself. Uh, watch out what's motivating you. Is it the need to express it? Is the love of it? Is it the money of it? Is, is it there fame money? Of it? How, does you, how do you get paid as a composer? Uh, how does a composer get paid? Well, a composer gets paid very simply. Number one, when you have um, a show, you get a percentage. Of the box office. Of the office. box office. Now, these days, of course, you know, you don't get the percentage of the box office. And I must tell you, I miss it. Well, Betty Compton said, once more before I die, I want a percentage of the gross. I want to get a gross. percentage of the gross. <laughs> right. you know, so anyway, uh, but you were saying that you... you and I won't go through the bitterness right. of that. No, 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 no. No, 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 no need for bitterness listen, over there. Listen. Wait a minute. Just, just hand me a few Kleenex and we'll, work, we'll talk about it. That's all for the, All the tears will so come. So people have to feel it in their gut. You have to feel it in your gut because what it is is that it's not an easy business. It is not a frivolous business. Uh, there, it's a very difficult business where you also have to learn that it's not going to be easy. That it's not you know there's not little ditties that you're singing. These are things that come out of the gut. Every one of them has got to be a symphony. <laughs> and uh, also a, a very important thing. You've got to learn how to collaborate. That means both listen? Yes. Listen. Open up your ears. That doesn't mean you don't have your own convictions, but be sure of your convictions. You know, test them and make sure that you're going in and fighting for something you really believe in. Don't go waste it hmm. on something that you're thinking, well, but I want it. Um, how do you choose collaborators in that, in, in, if it's in, so important to listen to them? How do you choose them? Well, what it is is that sometimes you have a better time than others. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have not been a monogamous uh, composer with lyricists. You've worked with a lot of different lyricists. How did you find the different lyricists? Well, I worked with Carolyn Lee for a long time, you know, and then I decided that uh, everybody has a different thing. But I'll tell you this, is that I got something, we wrote something quite different. Carolyn Lee and I, then I wrote with Dorothy, and I wrote something quite different with Michael Stewart. So it was an inspiration to you to take on something, different collaborators, something and that's else. a comfortable, that's it's a, a close it's, collaboration. It's, yes, it's something that happens. Uh, for example, to go to Richard Rogers, Richard Rogers worked. Who well, I admire Richard Rogers, you know, because also the fact is that he was a very nice man. He called me. Not everybody is going to have Richard Rogers call when you've had two songs out and say, "What can I do for you?" Oh, that's good. But, he but that's also, do you, do you do that with young, young composers? Do you sometimes, call sometimes. Do Not you, always, I must say. Have you signed? I, wasn't, I, didn't, I didn't, yes, I did, as a matter of fact. Um, I'll, get, I'll get into that in a second. I, well, you know, but Richard Rogers did that call. And, but I've lost my train now. Well, I was, I was asking if you yeah. had signed any young did composers any? to your music publishing company. Uh, well, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, David Zippel was giving, was, uh, was, uh, was publishing David Zippel's work the things that he did with Barbara Cook. And when we were doing City of Angels, he called me up and he said, I'd like, I'd like for you to, you know, to consider me for this. 
So you were already publishing him? Yes. And then he wanted And he to, called me. said, I want to work with you. And he said, I want to work with you. Now, I must tell you, with uh, when we did City of Angels, we're jumping. You're right, that's but, okay. Uh, jumping is uh, good. But I'll tell you, you know, this, uh, just to continue the, that particular train mm -hmm. of thought, uh, Larry Gilbert and I, you asked me, did I, you know, did, you think, did I innovate anything? Yes, I innovated City of Angels. I had this feeling. We talked about my jazz background. And I said, I wanted to do a truly jazz musical. And I really wanted to do I said, I want I said, I hear jazz in shows and theater, but it's not real. It's not the things that I hear at the blue note, and it's not the things but, that I was playing. But isn't it Well what it is is there is a feeling of improvisatory. I mean, let's face it, you know, that's a uh, I could jump into something else, you know, which is uh, this is gonna take us very far afield. Yeah. I am currently doing a series of jazz cycle of songs. Mm -hmm with Marilyn and Alan Bergman. And they were asked that we were commissioned to do this by uh, Billy Taylor called us, who's in and so forth, to do it for the Kennedy Center. Now, the question is, when we got together, and we said, what is a jazz song? Is it uh, Lullaby of Birdland? Is it uh, Take the A-Train? Or is it All the Things You Are, which is played in jazz circles right, but wasn't just as much? Right. So, did you come to a solution? Yes, it's uh, there's a there's a jazz phrase in the pocket, in the pocket, which means it fits. It, there's a thing is that, it, which it, called a suit pocket or a pool table pocket. No, no, no. It exists in a pocket that you can't see, okay, but you feel. And what it is is that you know it, it's like describing music. One of the hardest things in the world is to say, nobody understands that. I feel, but in jazz. The answer is, I feel. And everybody says, well, how do you, what do you make out of that? Well, the thing about it is that there's a certain rhythm that works. There's certain tempos that swing. There are certain phrases that do. And you try to do that. For example, I would have never have written for a show that, um, that, I would, that let's say, that I was doing as a normal Broadway show. Uh, somebody would say, that's the opening of it. Right. Now, but I had to get special people to do that. Right. This is City of Angels you're talking about. City of Angels, because he wanted to do a jazz show. I mean, you, I'm, I'm, you know, so, so that's, I'm, I'm So I'm you, running. and your composer, as a composer, So I had, I had to, not only that, but I had to get singers. And I, I was going to get upon this a, a little later as we discussed Barnum, because it was the same problem in Barnum. So I was going to, but since we're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we talked to talent agencies, you know, the, the, not the talent agencies, the talent, the, 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 the people who are the casting people. Right. And they said, well, you know, who can we get? We get actors who sing well. I said, they won't be able to do it. They won't be able to do those close-knit harmonies. I need studio singers. And they said, who have just made an art out of close out harmony of listening, close but they're harmony, doing it for a microphone. Uh, there's all sounds and so forth and everything else. I need those people. They said, well, but uh, you know who are they going to? Who are they going to play in this? I said uh, nobody. Well, who can they understudy? I said probably nobody. Do you say can they act? I said probably not. Now, were you a producer of this one? So that every time you said that, you knew no. there was a financial ramification. No, 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 of no, no. No, so you can fight with the producers and say, I need this. I'm the composer. Well, it was the show. I mean, that quartet was you know was was my chorus. Yeah. I needed that, co and I needed them to give me the feeling of they could not do it. The whole show and the tone of the show had to be given to me by these people on what I wrote. And so we you had see another to example of the opening of a show and how important the opening of the show actually is. We told you where we are, where you were. I mean, people like um, a friend of mine, Gene Bach, for example, who is who's a jazz aficionado, would say to me, she said, I didn't believe what you did. She said, you know, I, she said, all of a sudden, I went to see the show, and I, the opening phrases came out, and she said, and I was pushed back in my chair. That's a jazz person. Right, right. But that's what I wanted to do. And you I wanted to tell you where you were right in the beginning. I like that, too. I like that, if you can, when you, you know, when you're opening up, even though you're not going dramatically anywhere, get them where they are. Right. Get, get that feeling of where they are. So, in any case... Right. I'll tell you now the upshot. Well, you know of this. what I'm going to do? We could go on all afternoon, but I think we're going to have to stop now. We'll hope, I'd love to continue this forever, mm -hmm. but I want to thank you for coming and talking about this. Okay. I've appreciated this. This has been great. We've been talking with composer Cy Coleman. For the American Theatre Wing, I'm Ted Chapin. The American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre 
is a project of the American Theatre Wing and the New York Public Library's Billy Rose Theatre Collection, Theatre on Film and Tape Archive.